Steve Wood, Recovered Alcoholic. Welcome all to the Great Reality Book Study. Um, we concluded uh, We Agnostics last week, and we did three weeks on that. Plus, and we entered that realm four weeks ago with the uh, looking at different belief systems and all that stuff. And that was fun and spiritual waking, spiritual experience. Um, we Agnostics last week left us, left us with a deep question. We had to fiercely face the proposition, the question that either God is everything or else he's nothing. Where else a choice to be? Basically, we could stay bleeding on that shore of reason, or we can cross the shore of faith, and that leads us to where we are now in this book. Um, I'm going to put up a slide. There it is. So, counting doctor's opinion, we've covered 65 pages on the first two steps. That's a lot. That's a, that's a huge crash course that we have covered, you know, so far. And if you look at these circles, it brings one and two together, which is where we're at. We're exactly now in this book. We're not quite at step three yet. But, you know, step one is we admit we're powerless over alcohol, dash, our lives have become unmanageable. And you've got to think about what it said on page 30 when, when it said we learned to, we had to fully consider ourselves for alcoholics. And this is the first step of recovery. As I said numerous times in here, another word for conceit is surrender, which means to, um, you know, stop fighting some, admit defeat. They're asking us to fully surrender to our innermost selves that we are alcoholic. And the innermost is deep down within us. You know, the, the catch is in order to surrender to innermost self, you know, an alcoholic is. And we've covered all that. In you know, doctor's opinion, we learned the medical aspect of recovery, that the mental section, we have no defense against that first drink. In the physiology, we have no defense against the second drink. For that matter of fact, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and, and so on, we have no defense against. Meaning, when we put alcohol in our body, we crave more. And as I said, most, most times, you know, no, normal people don't do that. And any physical problem we have experienced in life that creates um, agony or pain, it's an easy choice. We don't do it again. If you go out and play tennis and you're, you know, 50 something years old, and like my dad, he was 56, I think, at the time, great tennis player, and he threw his back out. And every time he played, he's coughing pain. He, he didn't do it again. You know, he didn't go out and say, I'm going to go out and play tennis so I can throw my back out. You know, it's, it, but with the mental obsession, it's just this reoccurring persistent idea that takes away that choice, that reason. Even more important, you know, it, it takes us to drink against our will. You know, you, you get a, a new job, it doesn't care. Oh, a brand new baby's going to be born, that might change, it doesn't care. You know, I might go back to jail. Doesn't care. My wife says she's going to leave me. It doesn't care. None of this stuff comes to mind because, we have set, because of the obsession. I'm always going to go back to it against my will. I'm at the mercy of this obsession. Bill's story, we learned about the unmanageability, but we most important learned about the miracle of recovery. In the next two chapters, 26 pages, there's a solution more about alcoholism and hammered home even more that we're powerless because of this allergy obsession. He wants no lurking notion that we can safely drink alcohol. I have a friend, dear friend, who I used to drink and use with and stuff. And I found out six, about six months ago He's, I knew he was doing bowling, doing great. And his friend goes, yeah, he likes to have a beer when he bowls. And it was almost like I wanted to count down until he was, you know, employed, employed, and he did. Now he's back in detox again. He somehow thought he could safely drink. You know, once I've reached this, that place of surrendered in my animal self, then I'm powerless over alcohol. I need to get to that. And step two says, come and believe a power greater in self could restore us to sanity. You know? And here it says, willing to believe in the power greater in ourselves. Just willing. And the solution to have that power is 439. 
how, this is how we find the power. Where do we find the power, the book says? Deep down within us. And then remember, you know, 47 says, am I willing, willing to believe that there's a power greater than Just willing. You know, we are, are powerless or we're not. That's just the way we have to make that decision, that choice. Seek God or we don't. God is everything or he's nothing. There's no middle, middle ground there. But what's your choice? I can do sets one, two, and three hundreds and hundreds of times. It's not going to change me. Right? I know this book like the back of my hand up to this point. And it's not going to change me. I'm going to close this thing up. It's not going to change me. You know? You know, um, the, the whole thing with that slide, exactly where we're at, like I said, we're at chapter five called How It Works and page 58. This chapter is where we truly begin our journey to seek power. This is where we put our foot forward in the program recovery. The it and how it works is the solution. The solution is steps four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. A lot of people want to say the solution is God. That's that's you know whatever you you want to call it. But the way I was taught was, you know, you look at five times five equals twenty five. What's the solution? People will say it's twenty five. That's that's the answer. Oh, there must be five times five. That's the problem. The solution of five times five is twenty five is multiplication. The, the, the method used to the answer. So what's our method to, to find God? Four, five, six, seven, nine. So that's our solution. Um, this chapter covers in, you know, step three and four, it's four with very precise, clear cut directions. And we're talking about the next few weeks, how, how much pressure Bill was in. If he made one little mistake, he might mess this whole recipe up. So we're going to get into the meat of the program where change begins. Remember doctor's opinion. He says the, the plan of recovery, plan of recovery is covered masterfully in detail later in this book. This is where he's talking about. This is where he's talking about. This chapter and the next chapter work, you know, into action. That's what he's talking about. And it starts to get really fun, this book study here, you know, because the book study is going to, you know, turn into to a, a workshop because we're going to take our time. I'm going to go slow here. I'll probably do one page tonight if we're lucky. We're going to, to, when we get to step four, we look at each instinct to understand it, each aspect of four, every little thing. And if someone doesn't understand at the end of the group, I want to hear from them. E either in, with either after the group or, you know, reaching out. But, you know, we're going to look at over the resentments and fears and harms and sex conduct. And I want everyone to have a better understanding. That's the goal. But if one person, just one person gets a deeper understanding, I've done my job. That's my motto has always been. If one person listens or sits through this, you know, um, I'm going to refer to the original manuscript and a lot. And it's going to point out very specific things in there. So what, just in case you don't understand that manuscript. So when a, a book is written, there's what's called the rough draft. Let's say Rob's writing a book. So he's he has a notebook out and he's writing in the notebook. That's his rough draft. You know, and he's writing his ideas and everything down. And when the rough draft is completed, he's going to type out what's called a manuscript. And he's going to su submit that manuscript to a publisher. Now, Bill had to submit it before the publisher. He had to submit it to a, to a committee he had. <laughs> and that's where it gets fun bunch of drunks you know it but it must be close to finish product when you turn the manuscript in we accept it for publication and the publisher might suggest positive ways to improve it the big book really the manuscript is very raw and some people might have this book i highly recommend to get it called the book that started it all and it's the original manuscript where it looks like this all the notebooks, maybe Rob could put a, a, a link to it in the chat. And it's about 60 bucks, but it's worth every penny. Before I destroy it, I'm gonna put it down. I'm gonna put up a, 
you know, slide. So I show you, you can see what Bill was dealing with. This is actual notes from the committees of the, the conservatives he used, which are the religious members, the radicals, which were the atheist agnostics, and the liberal ones, which, which were the middle people. And so he turned, so first he wanted the rough draft, and they listened to him. And then they gave him ideas to change, and he turned the manuscript, and they did that. My thing is to try to make make sense of all this in the next few weeks. And you can see how much sense there's to make. There's a lot of writing in there. There's a lot of cool stuff. And you can see it's hard to read it all, but very cool stuff. You know, someone wrote Divine Consideration on the bottom. I love that. Right? Divine Consideration. Sounds like something those guys would say. Um, you think about it for a second. Some of you have been to a lot of meetings. Think how many times you heard how it works, Red. I mean, I've been going to A, I'm, I'm 55. I've been going to A since I was 20 years old, and I got sober for good, and uh, you know, it's about 31. And I would go, I would went to rehab a handful, you know, seven times, and I would get no more than three months sobriety or no, not past the third step in those 10 years. But I went to a lot, a lot, a lot of meetings a couple a day even my, my first five years of recovery this time I saw a lot a lot of meetings and I still go to meetings so I probably I don't know if I've been to 5,000 meetings I don't know it's, it seems like that that's a lot how it works but you think about it when it's red how often do you you know see people drift off or tone it out daydream they look around the room I mean, what was the last time you really listened for yourself when it's red you start thinking about it, you, you know and you really grasp what it means you know incapable of grasping it developing that everything which demands rigorous honesty do you know what honesty really means so my my job is to comb through the first few pages here and because the there's tons of vital information that needs to be very deep explanation and maybe next time you hear it it will mean something more you can ex or you can after the meeting, hey, have you ever seen this before? That's what I did. And, you know, I, I remember being at a big book study, and we're, at, we're, we're somewhere around here, and this guy who was an Irishman, and he would stand up in front of the room. He was, he was the guy that did the book study, and he would say, gentlemen, this is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> That's what he would say. And this is the truth. This is where the rubber meets the road, you know. Where the rubber meets the road is it gets serious, the moment of truth. You know, let's say I'm in a hypothetically, I'm I'm I build a fishing boat. What's the moment of truth when you put the boat in the water? Right? Is it gonna sink? I mean, we spend a lot of time on one, two, and three, like you saw. And we need help. And the person I'm taking to this needs help. We have, have seen others awaken and change. We want that. We've heard stories. There's stories. We've heard all the promises. And we I thought the promises were AA promises. There is no AA promises. There's step promises. The moment of truth, you know, seek God, take action. You know, that's we we've, we've heard this, you know, leads to a better life. Will it work? Will it sink? It's the rubber meets the road. You know, I, I mean, I knew this chapter like the back of my hand. For a long time, I was living in one and two and three. One, two, three. It was here's the best way I can explain it. It's kind of a silly way, but it's a good way. So hypothetically, I walk down the street and I fall into I'm, I fall into a hole in the sidewalk. I didn't see. I get you know beat up a little bit in that hole. I get trapped in there for a while. I struggle. I barely get out. Sometime later, I walk down the same street. And I knew there was a, a big, big hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same hole. How do I put myself here again? Pain, suffering, anxiety, all that stuff. I'm in there longer. I walk down the same street. I see that deep hole approaching. I fall in it again. It isn't my fault I fell in this hole. That's the type of things I say. I walk down the same street. There's that deep hole. I know it's there. I fall in again. I'm lost. I'm hopeless. I don't think I can get out this time. I barely make it out. 
I walk down the same street, there's that whole, I walk around it, I avoid it. I walk around it, I avoid it. Every day I walk around it, I avoid it. I'm scared of it. I walk around it, I avoid it. Walking down another street, you know, I, I'm sorry, I walk around it, I avoid it. Eventually, I make the decision to walk down another street. Walking down another street is a journey to the unknown. That journey to the unknown is step four. The bonus today, thanks to 10, 11, 12, and continuous inventory, I can walk down any street, make them all the man. I can walk down any street. It's a journey from um, ordinary to extraordinary. And extraordinary is that the invisible place within yourself, that's what it is. It's the invisible place within yourself you can connect to. And where your life becomes endless, you know, in, endless opportunity. New life begins. So four through nine is our road to change to a new way of life. So let's talk about this journey from extraordinary to ordinary. Let's go to page 58, how it works. It starts with a word name, I mean, a word rarely. It means almost never, rarely. So there's this urban legend I want to talk about that around AA for years that Bill wanted to write never in there. That's not true. Uh, Bill said, I don't know where it came from. It was never even a thought to put never in there. Um, but it's a promise. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has surely followed our path. So some very important words in this opening sentence that we take for granted when we hear it all the time. Thoroughly. In step nine, we hear in the promise, we hear painstaking. It's the same thing. Done carefully, completely, no stone and turn, not missing details. Thoroughly follow their path. If step four is, is thorough, there is no stone and turn. You know, you have laid everything out. You put it all out there. You know, think of when you, you can't find your keys. It's 7 a.m. in the morning. You know, you got you to get to work. And what does your mind start to do? Your heart beats faster. Fear kicks in. Start to sweat. You know, you look everywhere. You don't go, you know, I'm going to look a few places. No, you look thoroughly. You replace your steps. You, 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 you turn over everything, so to speak. No stone unturned. And that's exactly what they're asking us to do here, except we're not looking for keys. We're looking for God. Now, path. What creates a hiking path? You know? People, people create a path. It's formed by many people walking the same ground over and over and over again, and even gets deeper. It's a well-worn way. It's called an established line of travel, hiking path. If you follow that path, you will wind up to the same destination as every single person before you. Like driving down the road and following the directions to street signs. Well, G GPS nowadays. <laughs> um, you'll get to your destination. But if you ignore the signs or the, the GPS or wherever it is, you know, I know to get there. We get what? Off the path and get lost. And we say, oh, my God, I'm 40 miles out. How did this happen? So a path is access to a destination. And another word for path is the way. I mean, they said the Bible was a kid called the way. He's called the hippie by a lot of bunch of stone looking people on the cover. Sorry, but that's what it is. The hippies. It's called the hippie Bible, the way. So another word for path is way. So the path is the way. Our path is a method to find God. You know, I've been been in AA off and on, like I said, for years. And you know, by the grace of God, I mean I'll 24 years coming up pretty soon. Um, but I had no idea what the path was for years and my first i mean it was i got deep into the book right away but my, those 10 years i had no idea what the path was and we hear it by the meaning so it's very important to understand what the path is and the path is the how four five six seven eight nine if i if i follow that path so i took the path i know it and today i follow it i can show someone take someone else on the same journey so rarely do we fail, rarely do people fail who do steps four through nine. Four opportunities to do one-on-one. -on -one. 
Maybe I'll make Robert Carlos. Um, that's a bold statement, though. So the original manuscript, um, it says, rarely have ever seen a person who fails to sturdily follow our directions. Now, from what I understand, I don't remember which person it was. I was told who it was a couple of times, but I always heard different people. And one of them said that direction sounds like orders. So they took that out and someone suggested path. It just sounded good. And how many have, you know, how, you know, how many have I seen fail that have thoroughly done this? None. Zero. People always say that. I've never known anyone fail who's done the steps. Now, people will say, wait a minute. I did step 10. I mean, I mean, I, I did the steps. I said, did you do step 10? No. Did you make your amends? I made enough of them, right? No. There's always a hole somewhere. You know, those who I know who have thoroughly followed this, you know, the way it's laid out in this book, come to awareness of the consciousness of the presence of God in their lives and they're awakened they never have to, they never look back again now they never look back but they never think about anything to the past again except when they need to help someone so 49 removes the obstacles within you that stand between you and God you know where do you shove your fears within you where do you shove your resentments within you where's your guilt your frustrations your, you know everything that's why the steps are not about gaining anything they're about removing stuff so i can get closer to god so rather than worrying about what kind of god you had or have or you must need you know or if, or if you, you know your god is better than everyone else's focus on removing the stuff just to be closer to whatever god you know you believe in or have an idea of and god will disclose himself to you you know and that's where you receive the new attitude and new relationship with your with your creator to investigate and discover what's blocking you remember page 55 said the consciousness of your belief will sure to come to you they guarantee that back to the book those who don't recover that means recover means restore to health um and remember bill wilson calls recover freedom from alcohol right those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. So there are, you know, there's those who cannot and will not in this program. See our way of life. They won't give themselves to the simple program. You know, they cannot, this is from my experience of sponsorship. I had the joy of sponsoring many, many people. I don't consider someone a sponsee until they get the four, but let me rephrase what I said. I have the joy of taking many, many people through the first three steps and some in the recovery um you know the cannot is the closed-minded person with a negative defensive attitude you know there's the old saying you know one of them you know there's an old saying my grandma used to say uh where satan says better rule in hell than serve in heaven you know basically it's better to you know to um to, to rule in the in your misery than be honest and that's where like the, the, i see the cannot you know um you know the, the will not is just a stubborn alcoholic who's who's just not ready to accept this way of life not ready yet now both of them are not ready yet but are you a cannot or will not or just a not <laughs> you know you can untie that knot Usually men and women are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. Hmm. It says incapable, that means unable. Now, with them, I'm talking about self-honesty here. And the best definition of honesty is the awareness of where I'm at. Do I have fear? What is the fear? That's what step four is going to teach me. Not more, not just do I have fear, but what creates it. Same thing with resentment. Do I have resentment? If you don't, you don't know where you're at. Everyone will be all everyone else will always be the cause of your problems. I always believe the circumstances of my life are outside of myself. Now look what it says next. Those who about those who cannot be honest with themselves. They are such unfortunates. They're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. Now, are they born that way? No. It does not say they are born that way. It says seems appear to be born that way. People write them off. We're not born that way because people come out do these steps and change 
people say, you know, I say a lot of people in recovery don't want to do the steps. And then in the what I hear, it's just, just the way I am. Or uh, if they check in at the meeting, I'm sorry, you know, I, I screwed someone over for some money. It's just the way I am. Or, you know, I fucked my boss up. Page. I'm recovering. Ha, ha. You know, and a lot of people here have done that. You know, so there's people also, you know, diagnosed with different different disorders and they do the steps and guess what? They come out of that. Um, they told me when I was, you know, I, I was ADD. I was diagnosed with ADD, oh, probably 78 or something like that. So I was nine, you know, and then by 14, manic depressant. And, you know, of course, I didn't want anyone to know about this stuff. It was secret. That that worked really well for me. Other things that, you know, like Phil said, it's just the way Steve is. He will always be, you know, you have to deal with that. And, you know, take these meds, which my mom would never let happen. If I did the steps and it all went away, and that's, that's the miracle of it. And one of the biggest defects the rooms in the rooms is people who question the miracle. When I say they went away, there's people in here right now who question that. Right? There's people at the meetings when I talk about my spiritual experience, profound. They roll their eyes. You know, don't question the miracle. Trust the miracle. Because what legs are you standing? How many legs are you standing on? You know, seek the miracle. And if you experience the miracle, guess what? You know it. You're you're living the miracle. See also says here they are naturally incapable of grasping the development of living which demands rigorous honesty. So, one of the deepest parts of the book is right here. Original manuscript says they are natural and capable of grasping and developing, developing a way of life which demands rigorous honesty. So a lot of stuff in here is deep right, right here. If I if, if I hold my phone with, with two fingers, and if, if I'm standing next to Rob, he can easily rip that phone out of my hand, right? He can't take it away, right? If I hold it, he, he can. If I hold it firmly and he tries to take it out of my hand, it's going to be a fight because he can't rip it out of my hand. No one can take it away. That's grasping something. That's holding something firmly. But it also means to grasp, also means to grasp something mentally, a deeper understanding, fully comprehend the nature and meaning of something. If I grasp a manner of living which demands rigor honesty, I'm holding it firmly. To do that, I have to understand and fully comprehend the nature of honesty. You must grasp honesty before you can develop it. And notice that it does not say develop a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. I'm sorry. It, it, yeah, demands rigorous honesty. It says a manner of living which demands, I mean, sorry, manner of living which demands honesty. It says rigorous honesty. People forget the rigorous part and what that means. This book all through it. And Silkworth says it perfectly when he says entire psychic change. Everyone has psychic changes all the time, but not entire psychic change. And then now he's saying complete honesty. Rigorous means complete. Complete honesty is, is going way deep. You know, it's do I have fears? Do I have resentments? It's it's not that. It's do I have pride? Do I have self-esteem that's crazy? Do I have emotional security that's crazy? If I'm not aware of my instincts are misdirected, it leads me to selfish, self-seeking behaviors the rest of my life. And of course, dishonesty. Complete honesty is living day to day in honesty. People say it's not possible. You can't have complete honesty. You know, you can, but you can't have it by just thinking about it. Your resentment series, solving it in your head. You, you might have some, you know, of the picture, but not all of it. You need a tool to do that. We need a tool to be completely honest and see what's controlling our thinking and driving us with all those instincts. And the average person that we bump into the streets and walk by will never have that tool, but we do. It's a gift called personal inventory. So with inventory, I always see where I'm at in seconds, not in my head. I'm not in the spot checking stuff. I'm in spot checking my whole life. I didn't get me anywhere. Or I don't play the tape through. My tape player broke years ago. You know, I mean, I I see the third column that affects my the instincts without writing it out. 
those things that will always be driving controlling me gaining awareness of you know gaining awareness of what controls controls is finally important because what i'm aware of in life what i'm aware of i can't control and i can work on it i can let it go but when i, I can go make amends when i'm not aware of it will continue to control me blindly if i'm not aware of what causes and drives my resentments they always will control me you know they say if you squeeze um an orange what comes out of the orange a apples apple juice no lemon juice i mean <laughs> orange juice if you squeeze an, a, a, a loving person what comes out love you squeeze an anger person what comes out anger you know by being completely honest with myself through inventory i get rid of all that stuff it's then we can see ourselves who we really are so we always need to do written inventory when something comes up not if they come up but it's when they crop up so without inventory i can see the entire picture i, I cannot see the entire picture you know when i do 429 the first time when i did the first time we experienced complete honesty and once recovered we're living in that 10 11 12 that's the manner of living and one more thing on here you notice it does not say request rigorous honesty it says demands rigorous honesty so there's a difference between a demand and a request a request is soft-spoken like i might say hey rob please pass me that pen a demand is more like give me the damn pen spoken harsh and with intimidation it's like think of the old west when they would rob the stagecoach right they didn't go can i please have the strong box no they put a gun to you and they said give me the f and strong box what's the threat if you don't you're gonna get a bullet so behind every demand there's a threat so the question here what is the threat if we're not honest well let's see he says their chances are less than average that's our threat if we're not rigorously honest the threat is our chances are less than average not average less than your chance of, of sustainable recovery is slim you might make some meetings you might be happy for a couple minutes during the day but not like the steps give you you won't experience the joy and you might bounce in and out of the rooms for a few years and might get enough resentments where you don't want to go back to a meeting for a while or whatever i've seen that happen for years i did that but it will catch up to you and you'll never achieve the long-term recovery and there's a reason why people say i'm recovering because that's where they're at that's what sobriety that's that's sobriety not being honest so here's why you know because honesty is based on self-sufficiency what self-sufficiency relying on self honesty is based on god reliance it is impossible to be dishonest and god reliant at the same time it's impossible to hate and be god reliant at the same time i don't care how cool you are it's impossible i don't care how many you know service you know meetings you go to or services you attend to at church on sunday or what mosque you go to or wherever it is if you're not being honest you don't have god you might have some cool beliefs my grandma used to say don't call yourself a gardener so you so, so the fruit bears when you know you look around you know come the presumption that they're you know my grandpa used to say look at you know come the presumption that you're a dishonest person because nearly every person i've ever met in recovery comes from you know from from that but they also they also have the, the presumption that they're honest well, i'm an honest person and then they do their fourth step and they go you know so when persons you you know used to ask you know if you're on you're honest did you say you know you would say uh you wouldn't say no if you were like yes i'm honest but if a person is asked if they're dishonest no no you know they always say they always say they're honest but they're not that's pride 
That's one of the instincts. It's pride of spirit, what other people think of me. So a big part of being dishonest is pride. In plain and simple, if you're not honest, you cannot have personality changes to bear, bear recovery. Recovered. Back to the book. There are those two who suffer, who suffer from grave uh, mental and emotional disorders, but they, but them, them too, um, but many of them do, do, do recover if they could possibly be honest. All right. Perfect. I'm home. You know, I had that, that stuff. Grave emotional mental disorders, you know. So what's the best medicine we can take? Well, I mean, some people need the other stuff, but honesty is the best medicine, you know. I just, you know, mention about the miracles that happen. You know, think of it this way. Look at this here. Our stories is closed in a general way. What we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. So this is a formula that people use to follow when they share a meeting. And for some reason, the fellowship, some guy will get up there, a woman will get there and say, that they, I'm, I'm going to talk about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. That's not what it says. It says what we used to be like, not it, be, right? That's not, you know. It says what I used to be like, what happened, and what I am like now. You know, the it is alcohol. That's why we get so many drunk logs. They share it was like. So we get 20 minutes of a 20 minute share, we get 19 minutes and 35 seconds of a drunk log. And oh, yeah. Yeah, do those steps somewhere. They're in here somewhere. Oh, yeah, there they are. You know, and that's what they do. And that's what happened. I, I wound up here, and, and then it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I would say that do the steps. I couldn't even believe that I was even sharing meetings. I didn't know any better. You know, if they're not talking about what they were like, they're, you know, they've never done the steps. I mean, they're always, if, if they're not talking about that what was like. So if I've never did the steps, how do I know what I was like? You know, thanks to the steps, I know what I was like. So what was I like? Well, I had an allergy obsession of alcohol. You know, but I don't say those words necessarily. I explain what happened with my body, but I also explain what I was like. I was ruled by resentments. I was ruled by fears because I was driven by misdirection instinct. The bedevilment was 52. For what happened, I had a high-speed chase with the cops and I got here. No, that's not what happened. Go to page 25. This is what happened. And see, the, hold the page you're at. The great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences that revolution our whole attitude towards life and towards our fellows and towards God's universe. So, you know, I did the steps on everything and boom, I had this, you know, I'm not the same person anymore and I, and I went and Made made these awesome amends. Here's a couple of them I made. Blah blah blah. I'm awakened. And for what it's like today, here's here's another part right underneath that the central fact. Our life stays out of the certainty that our Creator in our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. Commence to accomplish things which we can never do for ourselves. So once we experience the steps, you know, we share that. Don't try to you know fit in with everyone else by giving the you know. The story of having you having open heart surgery or something, you know, the fifth time or whatever it is, you know, or how you you drank yourself to death. You know, Doctor Bob said we know how to drink. You know, matter of fact, in those days, you weren't allowed to speak. We did your fist up until you did your fist steps. Why? Because you had nothing to say. If you never did your fist up, you got nothing to say. I don't mean to offend anybody, but that's the truth. Otherwise, you're talking about the same running in circles you do every day. You know? You know, people, you know, I remember once I was sharing a meeting with another guy, two up hour speakers, and the first guy was this locker room style loud guy. He was a cool dude. I liked him. But his war story, war story, funny stuff, like a comedian. And I get up there and I guess, you know, shed some tears. I talk about my step work. I talked about my relationship with my grandmother and you know certain you know people shook their heads but one guy came up to me afterwards and he says man your story was boring you know he wanted to hear about the other guy's ods and running off the goat off the hill or whatever he said i forget but you know but before i had awakening i always it was stuck in what it was like i always thought i was the victim so i finally did the steps i discovered what happened 
when I did this stuff to discover what happened like now. Let's go back to 58. So this is one that I never understood. It says, if you decide you want, we have. And I would look around the room. I, I, I always went to, to, to the, the ghetto to the meeting, so to speak, you know, the rec areas. And I look around the room and I would go, there's no one here that has anything I want. I go to the rich areas and I go, I want that guy's Ferrari. I want his girl. You know, that's not what they're talking about. Before I did the steps, I kept wondering why, you know, they keep asking, do you want what we have? And I would, you know, maybe the material stuff, but I remember, you know, I'd see those guys pull the fancy cars and I don't know, oh my God. And they're, they're talking about, the we is the first 100. Do you want what the first 100 have? So if you decide you want the first 100 have, and here and here's the conditions and are willing to go to any lengths to get it you are ready to take certain steps willing to go to any lengths that's a condition original manuscript says are you ready to follow directions you know what is going to any, um, any lengths look like you know going to lengths is a condition we must have prior to doing the steps if you're not willing to go any lengths you're going you know you, you are saying you know, you're not going to be honest. You're not going to be thrilled. Think, just think of Fred's story for a minute, you know. So going at lengths is complete, rigorous honesty in four and five. So I can have the capacity to do six and seven. So I can all of a sudden go, oh, I can go make those amends. Six, th that, that hour you spend six and seven is going to make you want to go make amends. You know, that's where people fall short because they don't go to any lengths. You know, and it's going back to play. You know, I can't go back to places I stole from to make those amends. I can't go to my ex girlfriend's house. My ex girlfriend had a restraining order against me. I still went. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, you know, because I was dying. I was running for my life. You know, I made amends to anyone that would that I hurt, and I didn't look to care about the consequences. But if you're not willing to go to any lengths, does that mean you don't want what they have? The first 100? You know, look what it says. That some of these we balked. Balk refers to refuse to comply. So the origins of the word balk, balk, uh, balk is actually funny. It's not from baseball, but it's a, it's when a donkey would refuse to move, move forward and you would, guys sitting there trying to pull it. The donkey's balking, it's sitting on the ground, refuses to move. So some of these we refused. Why? We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. First of all, we love the zebra software. He tells us right here, we cannot. Now, how, you know, there's not one person in here at some point did not try an easier, softer way. Even, you know, I mean, I've done before I even was an AA, just quitting on my own, you know? And, you know, the 12 steps is our final stop to try to finally get this, you know? Original manuscript said, rather, you know, but it says, but we can, we cannot, it, it says, we, uh, you easier the way, yeah, we can fight yourself the way, but we cannot doubt if we, and he says, we doubt it if we can. It said, so it, it, they put that in there, but we could not, we said, it said, we could not, but we doubt if we can. The easier softer way we tried, you know, is, is not trying a spiritual solution. So the, the, so and going to any lengths and all that is a spiritual awakening, going for spiritual awakening. Anything you ever tried that did not remove the obsession is an easier, softer way. Think about that. You might like those ways, and they're cool. I mean, I love going to Buddhist monasteries and doing meditation and stuff, but it didn't help me. I, I, but once I'm awake to the steps, I could go back to those places. With our earnestness at our command, they're saying, please listen. We beg you to be fearless. That's fact facing and thorough from the very start. You know, the very start of walking the path. Fear, you know, remember, fearlessness, fearless does not mean to have no fear. It's the ability to face them. We call it courage. So some of us have tried to hold on to old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go. Absolutely. You know, alcoholics and addicts, you know, are the most hard-headed people in the world. We will always defend ideas despite evidence to the contrary, evidence against it. 
you know, we'll, we'll be in the back of a, of a cop car, you know, you know, defending those ideas. What's an old idea? Resentment. Right? Resentment's an old idea. If you're holding something from the past, and you hold on to that to the gates of insanity and death, what they're saying, the result of holding on to old ideas was nothing until we finally let go. And the condition is we cannot let, let go on our own power. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't need this stuff. If we could let go on our on our own power, we wouldn't need to do any of this stuff. We would be sitting here on a Thursday and listening to this boring guy talk. You know? We need God to help us let go. That's why it says in Tari Ray to let God remove these defects of character. Let God. We let God take us to better things. You know, we have step four to write all this stuff down. We have five to discover why we hold on to this stuff. And we have six and seven to let go absolutely. You know, God is either everything or he's nothing. Meaning I'm either going to trust God can take me to a better, better things or I'm not. Remember that we're dealing with alcohol. Cunning, baffling, powerful. I mean, if this is alcohol in this thing, there's nothing cunning about playing about alcohol is looking for. Nothing. You know, nothing. Well, someone say, that's not true. I stare at my mouth waters and all this stuff. You know, there's nothing cunning about baffling about alcohol is looking for. You know, what's cunning and baffling is I'm going to use this fight knowing all the consequences involved. I'm going to drink despite knowing everything that's going to happen. I'm going to still do it. So the obsession is kind of baffling and powerful. You know, remember when you were a kid and you played it, you know, tag with your friends? Remember? And and you know, it's like, okay, and you say tag you're it. Well, you're it until you do something about this obsession. The obsession is it until you take action. And the, you don't choose the obsession that shows you a long time ago. Right? Just like step one shows you. Without help, it is too much for us now they tell us <laughs> but there is one who has all power that one is God may you find him now so you need God now not yesterday not tomorrow because where do we connect to God in the present that's why it's a gift you know because it's the present it's the present we bring old resentments into the present we bring i mean think about if you bring it if you put a sandwich in your pocket and pull it out two days later it's from the past it's not, not edible right we connect to god in the present think about you know this we have pain we have fear resentments we have guilt right and we think it's holding on to us but the truth is we're holding on to it right and we push that far inside of ourselves. And we have this, this thought, should I talk to someone about it? Should I be honest? I wish I could let go. Where those ideas come from? Within us. Where is God? Within us. God's been facing this for a long time. A long time. It's time we listen. He just, God just wants us to be free. And every time we think about being free... It's from God. Every time I think about maybe I need to go to detox, it's from God. That's why sometimes we're not ready because it's not coming from God. So we have this paradise, this temple inside of us where we, we just store accumulated garbage in there for years. It's time to clean it out so we can be free. When, you know, when we when we do it, it you know, it's like stocking soda bottles, you know, it's like shaking up a soda bottle, you know, it explodes. What happens when you really, or you put Mentos inside of the, the, the bottles they like to do nowadays, it explodes. All the liquid's emptied out, right? Same thing here. The condition is we, we will need to do the steps to pop that lid so everything comes out. And inside, what's left behind is God. You know, all we've done is, is, you know, is let that stuff out. Alcohol is just an attempt to be whole. Only God makes us whole. You know, and what, so 439 is the true 
spirit. I do like one o'clock walk spirits. You know, if I don't, I'm gonna continue to fill myself with alcohol, but I'll become home. Let's look at the what it says next. Half measures avail is nothing. So if if I give my you know one of you guys my phone number and I say which is nine two five four nine seven four nine four eight. If you look for a sponsor, there it is. Um, um, but what happens if I say four nine seven four four nine four? That's you know that's that's half measures. Nothing. W once I add the last digit, it connects. The same way here, you get a perfect connection. Half measured is those easier, softer ways we tried. Four four five six eight nine is the formula. We stood at the turning point. Go back to 53 real quick. So it says we stood at the turning point. Let's see what this turning point is. Back to 53. It says, when we became alcoholics, correct by a self-imposed crisis, we cannot postpone or evade. We can fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he's nothing. God is or isn't what her choice to be. What's your choice? If you're, you know, if you're reluctant to that, answer this question: What are you holding on to? Is it fear? You have some outside of you. I don't know if this will work, or maybe it's questions. Am I going to lose my life if I have God? You know, there's no middle of the road in this one. There's no God later on or half measures. God there is or isn't. And if it isn't, you're not ready for this yet. That's all I'm saying. But you got to realize something. When you're at this turning point, there's a very good chance. I know like Rob will agree with me on this. You may never be at this point ever again. We're put at certain points with people and the right person for a reason. And we never may never be at this point again. I may never have this chance again to take these steps. And move forward. So the turning point is when you you stop and you go a different direction. The turning point is not the same direction. It's a new one. Opposite. Go back to 59. And so what's it? Here's here's more of the turning point. We ask is protection and care with complete abandon. So when you turn in that new direction, it means you go under his care. With complete abandon, the care of God. You know, we keep walking in the same direction and wonder why we're stuck. Keep having a victim's mindset. It says, here are the steps we took, which are the suggested prone of recovery. So, in 1937, it's pretty much a, they, these guys, all these A guys were on fire. There's 40 members, give or take. That's the legend. And they came to this idea, let's bring this message to the world. And they were very serious about going on the speaking tour because they saw him and Fox and all these guys do it. But they had no money. And they sat around for a while and they came up with an idea for a book. And originally it was called Book of Experience. And they, you know, and Bill's probably like, well, who's going to write it? Or you are, you know. So he's a primary, primary writer. He had three years. Three years. They would they would never uh, imagine if you're in an A meeting and they want to write a new book and you know, hey, uh, I'll write the book. How much time you got? Three years. They would totally the laugh. People don't get it anymore. Time doesn't mean anything. The first three chapters follow, you know, you know, is all about drinking. And then we agnostics, you know, were challenged you know, these new spiritual ideas, but the next chapter, the most important was how, you know, how the works, how the solution works. Imagine the pressure on Bill shoulders when he wrote this. He had to come up with the um, spiritual plan that connected with every hard-headed alcoholic. If this chapter does not work, every everything he's done is gone. You know, Next week, we're going to look at the writing of the 12 steps in a very unique way. We're going to look at the rough draft, pieced together from 
different historians over the years. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna look into how we evolved the original manuscript and what the final step was. So you see different, you might look at step one and it went this way and then it went this way and this way. Very unique. And um and how you know each one evolved in a in very much divine intervention. I think everyone is gonna really enjoy it. Um be back next week. I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>